Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting the exhibition both to Seattle and Minneapolis. We are so delighted to be here. So thank you very, very much. Well, my name is Bitweile. I'm a Norwegian Danish artist and uh, I do paper cutting. And um, back in 2008, I was uh, aware that uh, the Norwegian Chinese dim diplomacy uh, would celebrate um, their anniversary, their 60th anniversary for uh, cooperation in 2014. And that made me think that this would be a wonderful opportunity to show the Chinese uh, that we also do paper cutting in uh, Scandinavia. Because when I thought of China, I, I didn't really know very much about China. And I thought, what do we have in common? And you know, paper cuts originally started in China and I thought that was a wonderful way to celebrate uh, this anniversary to do a paper cut um, exhibition. So I simply started out doing a lot of research to find the very very best paper cutter in China. And I searched for a very, very long time. And at last, I found a wonderful artist, a wonderful person. Uh, his name is uh, Chao, Professor Chao. He's a professor at the uh, Kaffa University um, Institute of Fine Art in Beijing. And what I found out uh, was that he was not only a fantastic paper cutter, but also he had spent 20 years traveling all around China in every province, collecting the um, paper cuts from the, um, the people uh, in the villages. And he had collected these paper cuts and made um, uh, uh, so that he made a small, you can say, museum for those paper cuttings. So I not only found a wonderful artist, but I also found a person who really knew everything about uh, the original Chinese paper cutting. Fantastic. And once you found Professor Chow and mm -hmm. you had the idea of this connection between Norway and China, how, how did the exhibit concepts develop and mm -hmm. you know how did it come from uh, your your idea to exhibitions in mm -hmm. China and in Norway and then to the Channel Islands and now to the US mm -hmm. what was that journey mm -hmm. like well, uh, it was a long journey. Uh, as I said, I already started in 2008 and 9. So um, uh, I found out that if I would like to make a cooperation with Professor Chow, I had him to invite me. So I, in some or another way, had to make contact with him. And I found out he couldn't speak a word of English. So um, I found a translator and we went to visit him and I proposed the project to Professor Chow. And I also had an idea that uh, our common uh, theme could be the dragon. Because the dragon, uh, you know, the dragon has been with us for all ages. Um, everywhere in the world, but especially in uh, China and Norway, because uh, the Norwegian dragon has been with us ever since uh, eternity, uh, ever since Yggdrasil um, uh, and the Tree of Life. Uh, that is when we hear, hear about the Norwegian dragon for the first time, and also during the Viking Age, uh, the dragon was very, very present. And the dragon in China is even today most present everywhere in the Chinese uh, society. So uh, I thought that would be a wonderful theme to build an exhibition around. So uh, when he committed to the 
um, the exhibition. Uh, I went to the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Norway and they actually liked the idea and um, the idea of this could be an artistic um, way of celebrating the anniversary. Fantastic. And then once, once the foreign ministry was enthusiastic about it, were there any challenges with the exhibition when you were putting it together or when it was traveling? Uh, well, um, uh, there was this um, language trouble, uh, but um, uh, as soon as I met Professor Chow, we simply just clicked. Uh, I don't know if it's something special about paper cutters, but we, we in a way, just uh, could communicate. And um, then we, of course, had uh, a translator all the time to help us out. So that was how we managed to, to, to talk about what we were going to do. There's an understanding that sometimes dealing with the Chinese government, there's some bureaucratic and other challenges. Did you face any difficulties with the exhibition as it was being developed or during the exhibition? I can tell you there was a problem because in 2010, maybe you remember that the Nobel Prize was given to Xiaobo. And uh, uh, at that point, the Chinese got very, very angry with Norway. So absolutely every uh, communication between the two countries stopped immediately. They would not buy the Norwegian salmon. They would not talk at a diplomatic level either. So actually, you could say that we thought our project was finished. But uh, we had this wonderful Chinese-Norwegian project manager and she said keep on your work, start cutting, do what you do best and I will try to find a way. Uh, and uh, so we did. And in some or another way she actually managed uh, to um, get the exhibition into China and we opened um, uh, at the day of the anniversary, late 2014 in Beijing. Fantastic. Mm. It's always wonderful to see how artistic exchange can lead to exactly. fantastic public diplomacy and it's a great example of that. And once, once it was exhibited in China, and in Norway, I know that it moved to the Channel Islands before now coming to the U.S. Mm. How, how has that um, evolution and growth of the exhibit mm. um, happened? Mm. Well, um, you know, the exhibition uh, is called Paper Dialogues. So it's all about dialogue between cultures. And um, at first we um, exhibited in China, in Beijing and Shanghai, after that in Norway. And then we were contacted uh, by um, Jersey Art House and uh, they asked they would like the exhibition to come to Jersey. And while I was aware that there were actually a Jersey dragon, I thought this would be wonderful to continue the dialogue and the exhibition to Jersey Island. And uh, in Jersey they have a say, uh, an old story that goes hundreds of years back in time where they have this Jersey dragon. So now we, um, in a way, um, the, the project evolved in exactly the way that we wanted. To, to start a, a dialogue between cultures. And uh, what uh, Jersey did was absolutely wonderful. They established a group of seven local artists uh, that would uh, go out in all the schools uh, in the island teaching the children about paper cutting and uh, about uh, the dragon and the dialogue. So they had worked for a long time in the schools before the exhibition arrived. 
And then Professor Chow and I had workshops uh, with uh, the, the artists. And uh, then the artist would go back into the schools and all the children would work on a tremendous big uh, dragon that was exhibited in the library while uh, after um, our exhibition uh, there. Fantastic. Yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, I want to I change gears a little bit mm. and talk about um, you and, and what was your, uh, your history as an artist and your inspiration to start cutting paper with scissors mm. and, and where did that all begin and mm. how, how is it that you've become um, so, uh, so uh, well, um, yeah, how, how is it that you've developed your art and your skill? Yeah. You know, in Denmark, we have a wonderful tradition um, with paper cutting. Uh, every Easter, every child will cut uh, a little paper cut, almost like a snow crystal. And um, they will put uh, a, a little poem on it and put a snowdrop, the little flower, mm -hmm. as a sign of that the spring is coming up. and. Um, this little letter is called a gegebreu. And uh, this gegebreu is not signed with your name, but only with one dot for each letter in your name. So it's a secret little letter. And this letter you will uh, send to someone that you like very much. And if he does not guess that it is I who has sent it, he is supposed to give me either an Easter egg or a kiss. And you know, all Danish kids loves this, and so did I. So uh, from the age of five, I was cutting Gegebreu. And in some or another way, I was hooked on this. I, I really, really liked it. So I cut a lot of Gegebreu. Then, when I was 16, I was for the first time in Tivoli in Copenhagen. And there I saw a man sitting close to the little lake in Tivoli and he was cutting something that I've never seen before. It was like, um, it was not like Gegebreu or Christmas uh, paper cuts. It was something very different. It was an, a, a little piece of art. And I got completely fascinated. And I stood and watched him for a long, long time. And something happened in my brain that day. Because when I came back, I grabbed my mother's embroidery scissors and I never, ever stopped cutting after that. So I, um, that was my start. Uh, and in, for some or another reason, I just continued and continued. And I thought it was a little weird. You know, when I was a teenager, I was paper cutting. And uh, it's, it was not very cool. So it would be, have been almost the same if I would say to someone, will you come home and see my stamp collection? You can hear it. I cannot say, will you see my paper cuts? So I, I, I hid my paper cuts under my carpets. Uh, so they were invisible. Uh, but I continued cutting and I... Um, got married, I moved to Norway, and I worked at the television station there, but I still was cutting. Then one day, it was a Saturday, I had been cutting a lot, and you know when I cut there will be bits and pieces uh, laying on the floor, and my whole house was full of uh, those uh, small paper bits. And then I had a visitor from the television, one of my colleagues uh, coming by, and he saw all that uh, laying on the floor and he asked, what are you doing? And I, I then told him that I was doing paper cutting and I showed him some of the paper cuts. And he got so fascinated that he grabbed his telephone, called the Museum of Decorative Arts and said, you have to come and see what Beat has under her carpets. And then they came and invited me to have my first uh, exhibition uh, a year after. 
So I never thought that my paper cuts could have um, any meaning for others than myself. But at that exhibition, I discovered that people really uh, liked it. They, they liked the stories that I was telling in the paper cuts. They liked the technique. And also, I think there was a fascination about this uh, huge paper cuts that I'm making because normally paper cuts are tiny and, and, and little and you also, everybody has, has tried it and know that it is a little bit difficult. So those big paper cuts, um, uh, I could see that it made some kind of impression. So I thought um, I could continue uh, and, and, and do exhibitions and, and so ever after I have just tried to follow up with the paper cuts um, the best I can. Fantastic. It's a wonderful story. Um, I'm curious as far as technique because this is something that you've developed on your own. Mm -hmm. how, how does your technique and approach to paper cuttings compared to Professor Chow's mm, technique. Mm -hmm. and do you find there to be similarities or differences? Mm -hmm. Well, Professor Chow, first of all, he has a big pair of scissors. They are like this and mine are like this. So that, of course, means that he has a much rougher way of uh, cutting his paper cuts. It's a more masculine way and uh, mine is more feminine, so to speak. Okay. Mm -hmm. It seems to work very well. Mm -hmm. when, when you came to the idea of the dragon and the dialogue between the Norwegian dragon and the Chinese dragon, how did you decide on what pieces to create? What, what was that like and, and what mm -hmm. were the stories you were um, telling? <clears throat> yeah. Well, um, Professor Chow um, uh, decided um, rather fast that he would make a nine meter long dragon. And I, of course, thought, okay, then I will make a 12 meter long. But of course not, because I want to show respect for this wonderful big country. So I uh, decided that I would make seven dragon eggs, because everybody knows about dragons, but have you ever seen a dragon egg. You have never, they of course comes from a dragon egg. And eggs are a wonderful symbol for new beginnings. So that was why I chose to make seven dragon eggs. And um, uh, I have divided them into three sections. The three first dragon eggs uh, that are a meter high, approximately. They will tell the story of the dragon, the Norwegian Scandinavian dragon, from the very beginning uh, uh, or from the past. Then I have a very huge dragon egg uh, which uh, represent the present. And it's very big because this is where we are now. And then there are three more eggs representing the future. So that was how I built up the story of um, the dragon eggs. Mm. And each of those eggs within those three sections tell wonderful <laughs> stories. Are there any of the stories that you want to share with us just quickly? Well, uh, I can tell you that what I really, really wanted was that my my dragon story should um, catch the interest of the Chinese um, public, the Chinese viewers of the exhibition. And uh, how could I do that? Uh, if I told an, um, it from my point of view, it would be too um, exotic, too um, difficult to capture. You, uh, so I, I chose it a completely other way. In respect for the Chinese culture, I studied it very carefully and I tried to find 
motives and um, stories that they would know a little bit about that could connect the two countries and then in, in my hope to catch their attention and curiosity. So, um, for example, um, Chinese uh, really like the number eight. That stands for everything that has with good fortune to do. So, when I would like to tell the story about the Norwegian oil resources, I chose to make the image as follows. Um, oil drops f are dropping down from a star together with an anchor, number eight, and diamonds. That is a symbol of the oil that Norway is so fortunate to have. And under this rain of oil drops, a Norwegian man and a Norwegian woman is standing, holding a rose marlet um, uh, bowl, to collect carefully collecting those oil drops, because uh, Norway want to share this fantastic fortune they have. Um, with not only the Norwegians, but with the whole world. So, to use the number eight, I caught the attention of uh, the Chinese. They would like to know why are there number eight in that uh, section of uh, the paper cut. And they would then be curious to understand what is it about this oil in Norway and their willingness and wish to share with the whole world their fortune. Do you understand? Fantastic, yeah, okay. yeah. Are there other stories that you'd like to share? Oh, yes, very much so. Yes, there is also uh, in egg number four, um, two small dragon eggs that has just uh, hatched and two small dragons are coming up, uh, a Norwegian and a Chinese. And they look at it, each other and it is love with first sight. So they immediately start a dialogue about how to solve the um, uh, pollution problems. And that conversation evolves in the picture or in the paper cut with cars and factories and all the smoke and pollution that comes from that. And that smoke evolves into um, monks painting the screen. So there are three stories connected that also um, will catch a Chinese interest because they love everything that is romantic and they love that those two dragons just fall in love and therefore they want to know more. Why are they falling in love? What are they talking? What, what is the dialogue? So that's the way I have worked into every item in the paper cut. How is the exhibit received in China? Oh, the Chinese are so wonderful. They are so um, um, they are so interested. They really uh, asked questions, and uh, they were very interested. As a, they, you know, they their paper cuts are very different from mine. So they were amazed to see another way of doing paper cuts. And uh, I was actually invited uh, to the most popular talk show in China, um, Star Avenue, it's called, where I was interviewed and uh, my paper cuts were shown. <laughs> and also, of course, the uh, Chinese television were, um, um, and, and radio and magazines and newspapers were at both the openings in China, both in Beijing and Shanghai. Fantastic. So I almost felt like a star. <laughs> yeah, you're always a star. And, and again, I, I know you've, um, you've, uh, your, your work and you've visited both Minneapolis and Seattle and, and other, other areas. 
in the U.S. with your exhibition, and uh, it's it's great to be able to invite you back to the U.S. Um, and it's been an interesting journey. Um, I'm curious it, when you're thinking about the experience the visitor has. Um, can you what what would you hope for? Um, the visitor leaves after he or she experiences mm. the exhibition? Oh, my hope would be that they will be inspired and uplifted and uh, maybe get a feeling that they, that they themselves can do a difference when it comes to dialogue with other people in other cultures and, and to be um, what is that called in English? To be um, open for um, and not afraid, but more curious to find out more about the other cultures. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And and what are you, um, so the exhibition has been in China, in Norway, the Channel Islands and now the U.S., Seattle, and Minneapolis, do you, every time it seems that it expands a little bit, um, what do you see as the future of this exhibition moving forward? Yeah, you know, we are so uh, uh, lucky because um, in Jersey, uh, they wanted to, um, to cooperate with us, and, and, and that's how the dialogue will continue. So now here in Seattle and Minneapolis, we of course have the Jersey dra Dragon with us as well. And our hope is that the exhibition will continue and get even more dragons with us. So wherever in the world there will be um, an opening uh, for the exhibition to come, we will come, and we have play, we have space for many dragons. Fantastic. Well, Bit, thank you so much for allowing us in Minneapolis and Seattle to share your work with the audiences here, and we wish you nothing but good fortune. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much.